If you've never really watched any of Sacha Baron Cohen's films, odds are you've at least seen some of his wacky, outrageous, controversy-inspiring stunts. There's the daring footage from the movie Borat of him and his partner in crime, Azamat Bagatov, engaging in the infamous nude hotel fight scene, or the hilarious depiction of Bruno flying nude through the MTV Movie and TV Awards, where he lands ass up on the face of famous rapper Eminem. Yeah, Eminem was in on it. Or lastly, the gutsy, cringe-inducing scene of the dictator spilling ashes on Ryan Seacrest at the 2012 Oscars. South Korea! No, 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 stop it! You've got Kim Jong! But today, I want to discuss the lesser-known side of Sacha Baron Cohen. The cerebral side. The more discreet side. The side that seeks to expose prejudice and poor ideas through a little bit of social engineering, film, and comedy. The first clip is from his legendary but lesser known work, The Ali G Show. To set the stage, he's interviewing several experts from the educational field, and he's just brought up the topic of bullying. Let's talk about bullying in schools. Yep. It's a well serious problem, isn't it? Was anyone here bullied in school? Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, uh, I, I can I, understand I, let's, that. let's make a distinction, though, I think, between bullying and real violence and danger. Uh, because I don't think there's any place for allowing violence in a school. So you must have been bullied. What sort of things did they call you? Well, don't tell me. L oh, no, let I'm, me let me guess. Yeah. What like four eyes? Or no, no, no. I like didn't wear smelly glasses. Or no, no. I I didn't wear what, glasses. Like, that. Uh, gay boy or something like that? No, no. Gay lord. I I wasn't bullied all through school, but I do. Ali G goes on to bully and ridicule the doctor in front of his peers. At first glance, I thought Cohen was being uncharacteristically mean to this gentleman. But in subsequent viewings, I begin to see the subtle motives behind what Cohen is doing here. Let's go back to the very beginning. Sure, of course. Yeah, uh, I can I, understand I, I, let's, that. let's make a distinction, though, I think, between bullying and real violence and danger. Did you catch that? The doctor states that, quote, I want to make the distinction between bullying and real violence, end quote, as to suggest that verbal assault is not real bullying. The doctor seems to have an antiquated view that bullying only manifests in the form of physical violence. In this moment, Cohen sees his opening. Knowing there is no distinction between the two, he shifts the focus of the show to the doctor. He goes on to bully, berate, and verbally assault the doctor, calling him Fifi Man, Lottie Dottie Boy, and Four Eyes. He gets the doctor so angry that he agrees to a physical confrontation on national television. So, does you think there's too many rules in school? In school, you I didn't ask you, Four Eyes. Uh Oh, all right, oh. wise guy. Yeah. I ain't so he small. Thinks. I ain't like a little runner litter. Oh, is that right? I oh, suppose right, don't laugh, right? Us. You're what? I wouldn't laugh, all right? Right. Well, what, or is there some threat behind that, sir? Yeah, you may laugh. I bet I could beat you up. I'm not so sure of it. Maybe we ought to try. We want to, to even up. sprinkle a little bit more meta on this subject, he's got this group of educators in a circle publicly condemning bullying in schools. Yet while Cohen proceeds to bully this man in efforts to expose his poor logic, they remain silent. Funnily enough, this man says nothing throughout the entire skit. In this scene, Cohen manages discreetly through comedy to expose two things. One being the flawed idea that bullying is confined only to physical violence, and two, how often that educators and people within education turned a blind eye to bullying even when it's directly in front of them. The entirety of Borat could serve as evidence for the point I'm trying to prove in this essay. To me, the film Borat goes to the heart of American spheres of the Middle East after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. After all, Borat came out only five years after. Borat's character is naive. In this film, Cohen presents us with a Kazakh reporter bumbling his way through the states in efforts to document and learn the customs of a foreign nation. Despite these best efforts, Borat's complete ignorance of Western etiquette gets him into somewhat sticky situations. However, from this character arises a likable and universally relatable individual. We've all probably felt like Borat at one time or another. You are it, Dad. Uh, yes. It's this lack of knowledge and general ignorance towards Western customs that allows people to put their guards down. In attempts to explain ideas or situations to Borat in their simplest form, many in the documentary do or say things, especially on camera, that they wouldn't normally. There's no better way to illustrate this idea than by showing this scene from the film. To set the stage a bit, Borat has found himself at a rodeo in Salem, Virginia. He's about to go on stage and perform his famous and hilarious Kazakh National Anthem to 
hundreds of unknowing victims. Before he goes on, an older gentleman is lecturing him on his, quote, terroristic appearance. They look like you. Black hair and black mustache. Yes. Shave that dead gum mustache off so you're not so conspicuous. It's Borat's naivety. It's his willingness to learn. It's his desperate need to fit into Western society that allows this man to let his guard down enough to lecture Borat on his appearance. He senses Borat's weakness and takes the opportunity. Here's another scene from the frat party in the RV. The topic of slavery comes up when one of the college kids asks Borat if they have women as slaves in Russia. Borat says no, but asks them if they have slaves in America. Fuck, I'll do it. Let me ask you this. Are women, are women your slaves in Russia? No. Do you have a slaves here? We no wish. slaves. No we Once again, Cohen has managed to put the subjects at ease. Because they believe he is from Russia and hold similar ideas as them, without much prodding, he allows them to expose themselves. As an interesting side note, the fraternity brothers attempted to sue the producers for defamation. However, the case was dismissed in 2007. Once again, to wrap up this analysis of Borat, I'm going to leave you with a clip of The Ali G Show. This one requires no explanation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank, Thank you, you very yeah. much. Yeah. He is your slave? No, 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 not a slave. Uh, he is his slave? No, 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 he's not a slave at all. We don't have slaves here anymore. Uh, you, yes, I hear you do not have. No, 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 no. Oh, why you stop? No. Well, it's it was a law that was passed that uh, they no longer can be used as slaves, it is which a is a good thing. I uh, mean, yeah. yeah, it is a good thing for them. Yeah. But uh, uh, when I talk to friends and family about Cohen's work, Bruno, it often comes up as people's least favorite character. I will admit, when I first watched Bruno years ago, it wasn't my favorite either. However, after seeing the character develop on the Ali G Show and watching the movie and its outtakes a million times, I'll have to say I absolutely love Bruno. He's a crude, brash, homosexual Austrian fashionista whose sole mission is to become the next Hollywood superstar. I want to be a star in, in a huge Hollywood movie. What I absolutely love about this character is how Cohen manages to expose the superficiality of the fashion industry. Moreover, how he seeks to uncover homophobia and hypocrisy by putting his subjects in precarious situations. Wow, there's so many stars in the sky. Full of them. Makes you think of all the hot guys in the world. First off, let's discuss the most glaring example of this. Here, Bruno is interviewing American singer and television personality Paula Abdul. In my opinion, this scene is one of the most outrageous situations he's ever put any of his victims in. Somehow, Cohen manages to get Paul Abdul to speak of her humanitarian work while sitting on the backs of what are presumably Mexican immigrants. This clip really speaks for itself. Helping other people is so vital to my life. Um, it's like the air that I breathe and the water that I drink. How Cohen yeah. was able to make Paul Abdul agree to do this, I will never understand. It must be some combination of social engineering and shock factor. However, when I really think about what I would do in this situation, I cannot imagine that I could ever be so shocked and manipulated that I could agree to sit down and be interviewed on camera on the back of another human being. Come back, please. Can you please come back? The next scene from the film is probably one of the hardest scenes for me to watch. Bruno has just kidnapped an African baby in order to organize a photo shoot that will finally catapult him to stardom. He holds auditions with several parents of the infants that he wants to include in his photo shoot and puts them in incredibly awkward situations. While interviewing, he continues to ask the parents if they are comfortable putting their baby in exceedingly uncomfortable or dangerous situations. Is your baby comfortable with bees, wasps, and hornets? You can really see the forlorn look on this woman's face as the photo shoots become more and more dangerous. You can analyze this stunt in two different ways. The first being that the parents are desperate for cash or two, that the parents are willing to do whatever it takes to jumpstart a film or television career for their infant children. It may be a bit of column A or column B here, but if I had to choose, I would say it's the latter. We live in a society where celebrity and fame are idolized. Through TikTok, Snapchat, and Instagram, now anyone can become famous to some degree or another. It's my personal belief that in crafting this scene, Cohen and his writers sought to see just how far they could push the parents, to see where the line exists that can't be crossed. To me, this is a critique of celebrity and fame culture and the willingness of people to do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. After all, this is the theme of the entire movie. Great, fantastic news. We have chosen your baby. 
to be dressed as a Nazi officer pushing a wheelbarrow with another baby as a Jew in it into an oven. Into an oven. Congratulations. How do you feel? Great. If she got the job, that's, yeah. that's great. Lastly, let's look at the final scene from Bruno. I'll let Sasha tell you a little bit about it himself. Uh, yes, I did. I so went back. basically, for people who don't know, we did this movie called Bruno. At the end, there's a cage fight <laughs> in Arkansas. A real cage fight. 2,000 people in the audience. Correct. Vic is the announcer. I make love to my boyfriend yeah. in the ring. <laughs> and then a riot started. All I hell did. broke loose. I the ending fight scene from Bruno, bar none, is the gustiest feat Cohen has yet to pull off. In his own words from an AMA on Reddit, he states that, it was very nerve-wracking because I almost got killed two nights in a row. At this point in the film, eight months have passed in movie time since we've last seen Bruno. He's now reformed. His new alias is Straight Dave, and he wants you to know it. He's given up his past homosexual lifestyle and is now one of the most ruthlessly hetero men you've ever met. Because in Straight Dave's own words, I'm so straight that when I bought my house, the first thing I did was break up the back door. In this scene, Cohen places prison parolees with swastika embellished foreheads, Arkansas natives, and others in the audience to witness his stunt. It's a complete WWE clone, replete with cheap beer, staged excitement, and attractive women, until his former assistant, Lutz, appears. They begin by fighting, but ultimately, as most of us know, they end essentially making love on stage, kissing, fondling, and touching in ways that absolutely inflame the audience. Some shout, some curse, and others stare blankly at what's unfolding beneath their eyes. Metal chairs soar over the barbed wire hexagon while bigots cast half-drank beer cans and t-shirts at the couple. It is truly difficult to watch. Luckily, Cohen's security team had built a trap door beneath the cage for him and his sidekick to escape safely. The two most definitely would not have been able to walk out of that event unscathed had it not been for the trap door. The ending of Bruno is the cherry on top. Throughout the film, we see various depictions of homophobic prejudice as Bruno makes attempts to climb his way to international celebrity. However, no other scene featuring Bruno either from the film or from his segments on The Ali G Show are as potent as this one. Sasha knew he had to make a clear and concise statement for what the film seeks to expose. It's truly troubling that at the time this film was released in 2009, that there still existed people who hated gays this much. The scene requires very little post-analysis. There's not as much trickery involved as in previous setups. It's just two men making love on stage and the backlash of an enraged, prejudiced audience. There's a certain itch that Cohen's comedy scratches that I find hard to find in other films and TV shows. The YouTube channel Nitpicks pointed out in their essay, Why Sacha Baron Cohen is a Genius, the parallels between Cohen's work and Iranian New Wave cinema. I believe this is important because it's what sets Cohen's work apart from his contemporaries, and how he manages to blend improvisation with script. There's an element of authenticity to his work for that very reason. The reactions from his targets are authentic. Through open-ended dialogue, Cohen allows the scene to write itself. This is not to say that Cohen and his team don't have a blueprint for how they want a film or episode to transpire, but I do believe improvisation and the unexpected are the most important elements to his work. The closest I've found to Cohen's movies is the television show Nathan For You, starring Canadian comedian Nathan Fielder. It follows the same semi-scripted nature and it's utterly hilarious. If you haven't watched it, I would highly recommend it. While some of Cohen's scenes and antics don't require much analysis, I do hope through this essay I've shown you the other side of Cohen's work that seeks to expose bad ideas. If you've previously written off Cohen's films or TV shows as too brash or offensive, I urge you to watch them again with an open mind. On that note, I'd like to end with Cohen offering his acceptance speech at the 2019 Anti-Defamation League ceremony. So allow me to leave you with a suggestion for a different aim for society. The ultimate aim of society should be to make sure that people are not targeted, not harassed, and not murdered because of who they are, where they come from, who they love, or how they pray.
If you're wondering why I didn't mention Who is America, it's because that show really requires a video essay of its own in the future. Let me know in the comments what your favorite scene is from a Cohen film or TV show.